Okay, everyone, and welcome back to yet another episode of When Movies Were Good down here in Melbourne, Australia with Matt and my weekly special guest star, Matt. Matt, how are you doing today? I am doing great, Rachel. I am sorry to listeners who may have just heard me take a gulp of water. I'm getting used to this new headset with the microphone <laughs> near my mouth. No, that's all good. No worries. Well, you, it, Coming through, we're still recording remotely because uh, I'm not sure how many people out there follow what's happening in our state here in Australia, but it's sort of a disaster zone at the moment with the whole COVID situation. So I was reading that they're actually making masks mandatory for everyone now starting Saturday. So this will be an interesting period of time. But, well, that was one of the reasons we chose this topic this week. So, Matt, we're doing films of containment and the two films that we're doing a Lifeboat, uh, 1944, Alfred Hitchcock, and 12 Angry Men, 1957, Sidney Lumet, directed. And the reason we chose these films was because they are limited um, setting films with Lifeboat being contained on a lifeboat only. And 12 Angry Men, other than the start and the finish of the film, is contained all in a juror's room where they are discussing and deliberating a trial. So how did you find these two films this week, Matt? Well, I love um, films where there's a very limited setting. And like you said, we had sort of two different types of confinement. One where people are confined in a legal sense. They're required by the court to be in the jury room. And then another by circumstance of uh, near mortal tragedy where they are stuck on a lifeboat after a bombing. And I enjoy seeing a contrast of characters often dealing with high pressure scenarios and being glad that I'm not one of them yes <laughs> yeah they're actually two they're two well known films especially i suppose you know alfred hitchcock some of his later films especially things like psycho and stuff are, are more known to modern audiences uh, and but 12 Angry Men is still is still a film that's very well known but it's also a very well known play I've seen actually two groups of, of youth theatre students do this play and they were outstanding yeah I think so, there's barely a high school that hasn't done that play yeah the last incarnation of 12 Angry Men I saw was actually 12 Angry People so obviously they had a lot of uh, women in the cast as well and it was a youth theatre group up here in Melbourne in Frankston and for those classic film buffs out there that's where On the Beach was shot and they did a fantastic job of it they had the table seating in the middle and we all sat around them and we were welcome to look at the evidence when in, in between acts and it was it when they actually had a, a young lady playing uh you know the Henry Fonda character so I just thought the whole thing was really entertaining and I had a great night but every version I've seen of 12 Angry Men has been really good but um, what we'll do is we'll start obviously as we always do with our oldest film first so that's 1944's Lifeboat directed by one of our favourite people Alfred Hitchcock uh, produced by the great Daryl F. Zanuck the story was, I didn't actually realise this, but the story was by the very famous novelist John Steinbeck, who a lot of people might know from Grapes of Wrath and Mice and Men and East of Eden and, and very famous books like that. Um, but the screenplay was adapted by Joe Swirling, who was quite well known for some of his other films that he did, and apparently John Steinbeck didn't like what he did with uh, with um a lifeboat. So just to refresh the audience's mind, the film is set entirely on a lifeboat launched from a passenger vessel which has been torpedoed and sunk by a Nazi U-boat. So as everyone makes their way into the lifeboat, then the action really begins. So what were your general thoughts on, on this film, on Alfred Hitchcock's directing? What particular things do you want to discuss with this one, Matt? Well, what surprised me when I was seeing the film again, because I hadn't seen it for about a year or so, is knowing how controversial it was regarded at the time, because this was at the height of the Second World War, and many accused Hitchcock of having too sympathetic a portrayal of a German naval person in it. But I'm thinking, this, person, this German commander well, German uh, sailor, sorry, some spoilers, is scheming and doing sly <laughs> things all the way. I mean, how can it be sympathetic? But that's the thing. When you're in a time of war, people only want to often think of the enemy as a caricature, 
Like, I, I can even remember yes. when I was about nine when 9-11 happened, and that's kind of about the time when you start to pay more attention to what's on the news and, it, and everything, and even, and so it's a bit hard to know objectively what I, I was, how I was reacting as a younger person to if I were an adult during that time, but even I remember during that really tense few years, particularly, um, the, there was always sort of a caricature of the other side, uh, not much humanizing. Mm. And, yeah. like, we have different characters within the story that do want to either ha be black and white or some do regard them as people, others uh, have a more professional outlook, and you have a variety of... It's uh, actually mm -hmm. surprising within a boat how many different classes and professions you can fit in. And, and yeah, that's right. It's and races. A real, it was a real cross-section of society in that boat, but some very well-known classic actors. Obviously, Tallulah Bankhead, who I thought was absolutely hilarious in this film, just a look on her face when she's in the lifeboat at the start on her own. She was always primarily known as a stage actress. I always seem to th think she was this massive film star, but apparently that was the first film. So this film was made in 1944. It was the first film, major film that she'd done since 1932, so she was sort of in that silent pre-code era of classic Hollywood and then she went back to the stage and then she came back and did this film. We have William Bendix. We had Hume Cronin, who I absolutely love, I suppose because I grew up with films like Cocoon and stuff in the 80s when he was a very old man. But I just I didn't realise he had, like, this slightly distinguished accent. He was Canadian, so maybe, yeah. maybe that was due to that. And then Canada Lee, who was the, the black actor, in, and who was actually one of the first people cast in the film and he was predominantly known as a stage actor and obviously at that time there were a lot of, you know, societal issues to do with, you know, black actors and actors of other ethnicities. I think that's apparently. one of the first um, films Hitchcock made that would have had a, a, a in time when, because he'd only been in, in there from the UK less than five years, I think, and I don't think there were as many African um, people in the Europe at the time. So it was a, a, a bigger thing when he went to America. Yeah, I mean, and Hitchcock's always been someone who was sort of avant-garde and a little bit, you know, wants to stick it up people sort of stuff. So that kind of made sense for him that he would advocate and definitely want to have this character in the film. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, I found it, you know, it was – it's sort of a bit tropey in the sense you had all these different sorts of characters bouncing around and the villainous um, Willie played by the great Walter Slezak. Um, I know, I mean, I know Walter Slezak because he's, you know, a very well-known actor, but me, as you know, Matt, I'm a massive fan of soaps and his daughter yeah. Erica is, Erica Slezak is one of the most famous soap actors in the US, having been on One Life to Live for 30 plus years or thereabouts. Uh, I and always I actually, learn something from you, Rachel. <laughs> but it, actually, Walter did appear on One Life to Live with Erica at one point playing a family member or something. But, but she was genuinely nice. I wrote her a handwritten letter and she actually wrote me a very long handwritten letter back. And I always appreciated that. So I always have time for the Slazak family. But he was fantastic. Other than Tallulah Bankhead, I think he... He was my favourite in this film. I thought he brought a lot of light and shade to what he did, especially when, because he was Hungarian, I believe. So I, I don't know, maybe he did speak German, but I thought that whole riff of him speaking in German and then going over to English and everything, I thought he was he was fantastic. And I thought the other, I thought everybody who was cast in that film did what they were supposed to do. And uh, I mean, what did you think about the way the film was shot? Because this is obviously more your forte. Well. Hitchcock did do a fair few films where the space was fairly limited, but that tend to be, tended to be um, making the space more theatrical. So movies like Rope or Dial in for Murder, quite often it's taking inspiration from the stage play. I yes. can't recall exactly what led to the concept of a compressed story within a life uh, boat, but this is a far more... It's It's much less about the stagecraft and more about the concept of us literally being all in the same boat and yes. needing to get our heads together. And it's so for that reason, it's, I found it to be less about, um, the tricks of the camera and it was, 
Well, yeah, no, that's well, that's not fair. No, there was a lot of uh, clever cinematography. Uh, I, I did love the part with the boat slipping down, and also there's that famous cameo of Hitchcock's where he appears <laughs> as a get slim out of the newspaper. <laughs> well, apparently he he lost some weight about that time, and that was sort of how he worked it in, from what I was reading. And apparently that that Reducto ad when Reducto is just a made-up thing, but apparently all the um, people that went to see the movie were contacting the studio going, how do we get some Reducto? Because, <laughs> But apparently that one's used in Rope as well, um, on an ad in Rope, and that's his cameo in Rope. So I'll have to I'll have to actually look them up online and see and just reconfirm where they were. But his cameo comes in, I read, 24 minutes into the film on that um, on that ad. So, well, by his uh, standards, that's... By his standards, that's uh, pretty late. He usually liked to keep his cameos in fairly early because people would get distracted looking for them. Yes, yes, like so in Psycho, he's the you know the guy outside Marion's office going across the road, and yeah, he got that one out of the way quite early. Uh, but I, you, it's just something. It's something that's. I, I'm surprised more directors don't do that. I'd certainly be wanting to do that because it's a bit of it's a bit of fun. So he shot the the second unit um, on the film, shot the background footage, which I think for its time actually worked quite well with the indoor set that they had and how they used that background footage, and that was shot around Miami in the Florida Keys. So I believe that this the the passenger ship was sunk in the North Atlantic. But it, it didn't really, you know, they weren't going for terrible realism, I guess, as long as it was that sort of water setting. So, Mind you, the scene they have at the end with a bit of a ship battle and the ship is uh, colliding with a lifeboat. I actually found that to be a lot more convincing than Raise the Titanic, which was done with a much bigger budget uh, 40 years later. Yeah, that's right. That, so, yeah, I actually thought they did, he yeah. did quite a good job with the storm, with everything. I thought he did a really good job with all of that. It looked quite authentic. I mean, yes, it looked fake, but, I mean, by our standards today, but it looked a heck of a lot better than some other later films that came out, for sure. Yeah, and um, I think sometimes a uh, black and white uh, film, uh, because of um, how col- the colours of different scenery appeared, maybe also because you could you could probably get film stock that could be uh, shot at a faster speed. I don't know if that had an impact. I haven't got a good enough technical knowledge, but I don't know if that had any, yeah. any impact. But uh, well, Hitchcock thrived with less is more. Yeah, definitely. So he used a combination of miniatures and obviously the indoor sets of the boat and certain figurines when he needed to. I was I was also reading that many actors actually became ill on the set, like, say, for example, Hume Cronin, when uh, he went outside the boat for whatever reason, he cracked a few ribs, um, Tallulah Bankhead had pneumonia. So several people, it was actually quite a gruelling, intense film in terms of what they were physically asked to do. It was so emotional, especially the woman with her baby. And yeah, because they got wet. Perhaps it was the damp, the dampness of the set. You know, if you're always around water, even if you're not necessarily in it. Remember, they were getting splashed with water a lot as well. And then I, another I know thing. That, um, I, I know that when you have a large amount of artificial water, it can be a problem. Like I know when they make Gilligan's Island, they had to, I think regularly changed the water on set that made up the lagoon because it kept going mouldy in the California heat. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, Gilligan's Island is hilarious. <laughs> and then, of course, we remember Escape from Gilligan's Island where they just decided to make a boat and leave. I don't know how they didn't do that before, but, you know, that's. Uh, I do remember that. And so other things that the audience should be aware of when they're when they're watching the film, although they may not be aware of it at the time, is there was actually no official musical score in this film. And I wasn't thinking about that at all but there well, until I was reading about it, yeah. Well, it's not really suitable. I mean, after the uh, the sort of getting in the zone period when you have the credits uh, roll, opening credits rolling through, you want it to be focused on that deadly silence. And because there's not really much scene changeover yes you cut between the actors but it's really one scene because they're all all in the boat you can sort of divide it into before and after the storm but it's one linear story progressing tighter and tighter and tighter like every problem they deal with you can expect and they lay out from the beginning the shortage of food and the like. The one big twist is when it turns out that uh, Mr. Jerry can actually speak ye old English. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I thought that twist was handled very well. And, I mean, look, it's a film you just watch it from start to finish. You go on the roller coaster of it. You know, there's the twist that, you know, he actually is the U-boat captain and he is actually a bad guy. So when they were worried about how they were betraying him back at the time, well, I think he was pretty much portrayed as how I would have perceived somebody German in the army at that time, you know, being a bit stealthy and looking out for themselves and only having a plan for themselves. So I don't think that was a, a misfire on the scriptwriter's behalf. I'm no nautical uh, and- expert, but I'm but I'm curious to know how readily you could actually easily trick people into steering towards a supply ship versus yes. um, an island because whether or not you have the nautical knowledge, I'd have thought a ship is a much harder target to reach because of its size compared to a land mass. Yeah, that's, well, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, and also, just to finish off this section here with Lifeboat, um, when someone remarked to Hitchcock that there wasn't a musical score, Hitchcock said something along the lines of, well, where's the orchestra going to come in from? And then someone said to Hitchcock, well, where are the cameras going to come in <laughs> They had a good point there, but, you know, Hitchcock didn't care anyway. He kept going. So I this actually was one of the first Alfred Hitchcock films I saw as a teenager, other than Psycho, of course, and it did bring back some nice memories because I literally had not seen it for well over 20 years. So did it match up to the way you remembered it or...? Well, I uh, saw it the first time about a year ago, so I didn't have quite the drawn-out memory space. I did have a... Because that was one of various films that I was hearing of for the first time when I was reading a biography of Hitchcock, and I found myself I was I was I was reading it. I was forever going on eBay, like going, all right, let's find a DVD of this one and that one because Australian Netflix still isn't uh, that good a range for classic movies, so I had to find a lot of DVDs for yes. them. Yes, and I uh, really enjoyed it when I saw it. I mean, I love Tallulah Bankhead's dialogue. I mean, my favorite part of old movies um, uh, of 30s and 40s period is that uh, Bankhead and Cary Grant that's what makes it for me The yeah. uh, that's the, the favourite bit I always keep going to that yeah. uh, witticism dialogue yes no she was fantastic so I, I did I think this is one of my more favourite Alfred Hitchcock films actually so we both liked this one so we're going to jump forward uh, about 13 or jump jump forward into the future now about 13 years 1957 12 Angry Men very famous film and a very – actually, they said after To Kill a Mockingbird, it's the most famous court, court, court set film of all time. Um, now, I didn't actually realise that one – I didn't realise it was Sidney Lumet who had directed this. I thought – I don't know why, but I always had in my mind I thought somebody else had directed this film. And uh, I don't want to talk about Larry Hagman again, but he did direct one of my favourite films with Larry Hagman. <laughs> <laughs> called the group. Of course I had to bring Larry Agman up in this. Uh, now, one other thing I didn't realise, I had always thought this had been adapted straight away from a play, but it actually had been adapted from a short form, like, telemovie version from in 1954, which I believe is available on YouTube because I saw it pop up and I'm like, what is this? What is this other version of 12 Angry Men? Because I'm familiar with the Jack Lemmon 90s version of 12 Angry Men, but I hadn't seen this one. So that might be worth us to go and have a look at that, Matt, when we get a chance to. So, yeah, well, it's the sort of, well, it's one of those um, stories that uh, television uh, thrive, would have thrived on because you, it's mostly about um, strong dialogue. You don't have to have a lot of um, complex uh, changeover. And uh, so I could have well imagined that as a low-key television production. Yeah, definitely. We'll have to. I'll actually have to check that out because I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind seeing that. And I haven't been able to find the Jack Lemmon did a remake of this film, like a telly movie remake. It had a lot of interesting people in it, like Tony Danza, a bit more of an ethnically diverse cast at that point in the nineties. So I wouldn't actually mind watching that, but I've only been able to find certain clips of it, but I know I have seen it before many years ago in the past. So Reginald Rose was the writer and he was also the writer of the the telemovie version of it or the teleplay version of it. And he co-produced the film with Henry Fonda. And after Henry Fonda produced this film, he said he would never produce another film again. (laughs) So you either got a head for the business side of it or you're not interested in it. And obviously Henry Fonda was not interested in it. Uh, so this I'd is be obviously one of the check personally. 
Yes, well, a lot of actors only do the produ- – that's just a ceremonial job because they want to get more money and that's a way for them to get paid more money. But I think he did produce the film and he hated doing it from, from the account that I read. So just to refresh our audience's mind again about 12 Angry Men, uh, 12 men deliberate the conviction or acquittal of an 18-year-old defendant who has murdered his father or has been accused of murdering his father on the basis of what they call in the law of reasonable doubt – And this forces the jurors, led by juror number eight, to question their own morals and values. So I'm I'm a big fan of this sort of stuff. I'm a big fan of these sort of moral sort of plays and moral stories where a character can be in one place at the start and be in a completely different place at the end and you see them go through this journey and that's Henry Fonda's character of juror number eight. He's the one that leads all of the other jurors uh, on. And we don't know their names at all, do we, Matt, in this? They're only known by their juror numbers. It's not until the end that a couple of them sort of give their names and introduce themselves. So what did you think of this one? Well, you do touch on the valid topic where, in theory, they're like the ideals of the legal system would say that they're 12 anonymous people of impartial value. Uh, whereas uh, it makes clear they all have their own uh, biases and backgrounds, and sometimes it can uh, the different backgrounds can work in a higher uh, advantage um, if they know extra bits of evidence or the way to approach something. Where uh, a lot of um, critical critics would complain now is that the jury is all male, and the uh, what we'd consider diverse ethnicity isn't as much, although they do have several people which of um, different um, ethnic backgrounds which would have uh, recently migrated into the area from parts of Eastern and Southern Europe. And so there is, it it would be unfair to say that it is a a non-diverse jury. There are um, quite a variety of um, backgrounds to consider still, uh, but I... I do uh, have respect for Henry Fonda's character of being able to intelligently, um, because he's not necessarily sure at the beginning himself, but at least he's able to make them see reason, whereas I couldn't even imagine myself selling a car to someone, let alone convincing them that someone's not guilty of murder. Um, I'm a bit of an... um a contrarian, so I could imagine myself doing that because I'm always the first one to say... Cons- convincing against murder or the second-hand car? Uh, oh, both, probably. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm always someone that likes to stir it up a little bit and take the opposite viewpoint because naturally I find my viewpoint falls on the opposite. So I actually did love Henry Fonda's character, any incarnation of juror number eight, whether it's a woman, man, whoever playing it, and now that I have seen a woman playing juror number eight or a young lady playing juror number eight, actually, and she was fantastic, and she was able to sort of harness that whole issues of sexism and stuff because they made sure that the person going up against her in that play, the last one to change his vote, was a big, burly guy. So she was kind of going up against him. So that worked really, That was the same really, case in the movie too. Yeah, yeah. So... I I really like that and I like taking – I love the whole thing. One of the things I always remember in the first version of the play I ever saw and always it's done so well in the film is when they're counting out all of the steps and they're like, oh, he moved faster than that. And in reality, sometimes things aren't always what they see. So even though I found some of the stuff like with the – when they were discussing the glasses, you know, when the woman who claimed to have seen them, I'm sure the defence, um, you know, lawyer would have brought that up in the trial, but, you know, maybe for whatever reason that they didn't. But, yeah, because if she can't see anything, she's not she's not a reliable witness. So, But uh, I am so, impressed by how, uh, by how much they're able to do with uh, purely physical and logical evidence because... Uh, Quite often, uh, you'd imagine with a lot of uh, crime and television writers these days, they'd be lost if they uh, didn't have forensic science uh, toys to rely on for driving the plot forward. Like, oh, the, we, we, you mean we can't do a test that says that this grain of sand in a person's shoe can only be found on this beach at this time of day? And they had a yeah, photograph at that, that other time? 
so the fact they were able to use all that physical evidence, like working out uh, how you can step around a room within a certain space, uh, the noise at this time and that time, it, I thought it was very clever. Yeah, no, for the time, it actually definitely, the way that they went through the evidence and, you know, and it brought out all of their prejudices and stuff. And the sad reality is I, I've never been on a jury myself. I would love to do it. I don't think the rest of the jury... Are you sure? Be, yeah, I w- I, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, is that my sister and a couple of other close friends have been on, on juries. And unfortunately, like the gentleman in this movie that wanted to go to the baseball game, that's everyone's MO. They just want to get out of there as fast as they can. They don't want to discuss anything. And every single person I've ever spoken to who's ever been on a jury, even if they personally haven't felt that way, they don't care. And that's where a lot of the aggravation comes from being set upon if you do want to discuss things, if the other people consider it an open and shut case. I mean, don't rem- don't forget, the O.J. Simpson jurors sat through nine, month- nine months of testimony and only deliberated for four hours. Mm. Or, so they- um, yeah. or about 100 years earlier, the Lizzie Borden trial, you had uh, an all-male uh, <laughs> jury, and I, I don't think they even took an hour to decide that the Sunday school teacher could be uh, capable of murder and acquitted her. Like, a, yeah. we don't know, I still have a lot of research to do on that case, but I find it hard to be- I couldn't really picture myself going over the whole evidence of a long jury trial in one hour or four hours and being satisfied with all conclusions. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. So it's actually one of the good issues that this film brings up is just, you know, it's a jury of your peers, but it's only a jury of your peers if the peers are actually interested in discussing it. And unfortunately, most people... I, I may not want to be judged by, but I may not want to be judged by my peers. I may not like my peers. I might think my peers are stupid. <laughs> but I did, well, yeah, well, definitely. But if you've got a good person like the Henry Fonda character on your jury, then you might be, you might be all right. But I really liked... Um, Martin Balsam, who played Juror 9, who was the for- foreman, I believe. I really liked him in this film. Lee J. Cobb as Juror 12, so the argumentative juror, he was really good. People. But I really liked I really liked E.G. Marshall in this film, who was Juror 11. He was the very sort of like business-like person who was discussing the glasses and stuff at the end. I really liked his characterization in this film. And they shot it in pretty – they had a really rigorous rehearsal schedule and they shot the film in three weeks in New York City. So it was a, it was a tough shoot and there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of going back and forth and, and you're sitting in the one room. So you, you're right, it's almost like doing a play probably several times a day, shooting it at different. So what did you think about the use of the wide angles at the beginning of the film and then the closer tight in? Did you feel that that worked well for it? or? I thought it... I th- all except one chunk, a small part of the film, I thought was done excellently. I loved, at the beginning, you had that wide scene over the table, and then you had the sort of the crossfades of all the different men walking in. I thought that was very well. I like the uh, close-up cuts of a lot of the faces. I mean, I don't, I didn't like how they sort of cut out the top of their, their head and their chin. Sometimes I thought it was kind of like... Uh, I I'd l- I prefer them to still have a chin personally. I, I'm I'm a chin guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. so I thought uh, even though you were in a confined room, it wasn't like how like if Hitch- someone like Hitchcock were doing it, I imagine he would have tried to add a, l- a lot more movement to the camera. This was um, the editing we saw in Twelve Angry Men was a uh, more familiar with what we'd be seeing these days with lots of short cut overs. The one part yes. I didn't really like was when the jury that turned out to have a rather racist agenda when he was going on his rage and you had all these men so, sort of start standing up and each going to an obviously pre-allocated spot in the frame facing yeah. away from him so theatrical i don't know maybe at that time some would have um respected that big theatrical space of making him all alone but uh I personally thought it was far too theatrical for a film that had been so tight up until then. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, think, I think it... Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I, just thought that, I just thought that went a bit too far. Mm, I think it... I, actually, for me personally, I think it works better as a stage play because you can kind of feel mm. the tension a little bit more when you're sitting 
directly with them, especially when I saw it staged where they were sitting in the middle of us and we were all positioned all around them. So they were really encircled. So we were the walls effectively when we were watching them. We were the walls of the, the audience was the walls of the room and they had to perform within the walls with us watching them intently. So that would have been a very interesting uh, interesting way to perform the play as an actor. Yeah, uh, like yeah the- I mean... I. Well, we've all had um, that experience where we find ourselves through no fault of our own in the middle of a conflict someone else is having with someone else and we sort of have no idea what to do about them. Yeah, uh, yeah, I really, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it is a good, I, I like it. It's a good start to finish sort of film. It's not too overly long. Uh, Henry Fonda is good in this film. He's good at being Henry Fonda and Henry Fonda was needed in this film, so... <laughs> So, uh, I, um, I'm glad I saw him in that role first before I saw him as Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, I thought he was cute as Abraham Lincoln, though. I actually really, I think probably it was the nose. It was the prosthetic <laughs> nose that, that did it for him. But overall, this is just, I actually prefer this film than To Kill a Mockingbird. I think perhaps because I was forced to do To Kill a Mockingbird at high school and I, I don't know why, but I was a bit resentful of it. I just thought we should be doing something else. So I have a confession. I, I, haven't I seen need to actually go back and. Yeah, I have a confession. You haven't I haven't seen, seen it. I mean, uh, not yet, but um, I, I I understand where you're coming from. The best way to read yeah, any story I, is to make it a school text. Yeah. <laughs> Although now I actually appreciate doing it, but I would really need to revisit the movie again and watch it with a bit more of a fair mind because I was like 14 when I watched it. So I would really need to go back and, and watch it again. But I prefer this over – I like people's morals being challenged and their prejudices being challenged. And it was a, it was, it's a period piece. Of course it's going to be men there. They're going to be mostly white, you know. It doesn't – it doesn't worry. That sort of stuff doesn't worry me. I don't like going back in time and, oh, this needs more diversity. Well, that's the way things were back then. So now, of course, even, if you're um, doing it, it'd be, you know. Um, they seem to be more, a bit more focused on the – there were a couple of people that had a shared background with the with the person on trial who was from an immigrant background, but they seem to be a bit more focused on uh, socioeconomic diversity. Yes, yes, they were. Yeah, so, you know, and that's fine. And obviously if they made yet another version of it today, they probably would have a woman in the in the Henry Fonda role or whatever, and that would be just fine as long as they had the right person playing the role. So I don't of get too worried was, about things like that. Yeah, of, of course it was the wasp that um, uh, was the wise voice at the beginning. Yes, and wearing the white suit and all the rest of it coming out of yes. the, out of the steps of the dark courthouse and all the rest. So that was kind of a nice visual to have there at the end. So I, yeah, I like this film. I have, and I like the play of it too. So I'm I'm gonna yeah. go and watch the telly movie version of it too, the one that was done before this one. So I guess that wraps up our two films for this week, Matt. So Matt, yep. would you like to introduce our special event for our next one that we're gonna do? Yes, well, um, the last few days we all know a very sad event happened in the movie world. The Probably the last uh, true major star of the golden age of Hollywood, Dame Olivia de Havilland. She passed yeah. away. She was 104 years old. She had a good life. and She did. She, she lived a good portion of it in Paris. So Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I think we can, uh, I think we can be happy, happy for her. Yeah. So we are going to do a special tribute episode for her, and we're going to be looking at her most famous role in Gone with the Wind. 1939. Matt knows that I like short films, so Gone with the Wind, I've always seen different parts of it. I've read the synopsis of the film I've seen the start of it, I've seen the end of it, I've seen the middle of it, I've seen the house burning down. I've never actually seen it in its entirety, so I will endeavour to watch it in its entirety, and I want to watch it in its entirety, and I really actually am looking forward to sort of sitting down and and seeing this film with, of course, Olivia de Havilland in it, uh, Vivian Lee and Clark Gable and directed by Victor Fleming. I mean, this film is just iconic. And we're going to keep away from some of the more modern controversies about the film because, like we were saying, it was a period piece 
in a period piece, if that makes sense. So they shot it at a certain time in history and it was about a certain time in history and it's easy to look back on things in hindsight and say this, this and this, but we're just going to concentrate on the interesting things in this film and also doing a bit of celebrating of a great classic film star's life as well. Well, I think she was one of the nicest people you can met from what I've seen of her in interviews and what I've read about people's encounters with her. Um, not to Joan, but I'm <laughs> Well, she got the Oscar first, so... <laughs> she did, and look, Olivia outlived... Although Joan was very long-lived as well. I think Joan only passed away about 10 years ago herself, so she was I th- certainly... I think, they were, hoping, I think they were hoping to see each other out. <laughs> And I actually, um, so out of the two of them, I probably do prefer Joan. She just, the interviews I've seen with her, her personality is kind of more, more my type and not to take anything away from Olivia, but uh, I, I sort of, I've always sort of liked Joan a little bit more, I think just maybe because of the, of the, of the roles she did. And uh, I definitely will be able to bring Ray Milland into the conversation because Olivia de Havilland did work with Ray Milland and you know how important that is to me. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it will be a great movie. If you want to um, do some homework for yourselves, listeners, uh, before seeing the episode, by all means, watch the f- film. But um, uh, keep a careful track of your fluid intake in the early part of the film. You could regret <laughs> it later. Definitely. Well, thanks so much for joining us again today. Again, we are sorry. We're still cutting in a bit in a little bit in and out with the sound because we've had to go back to doing it over Skype and remotely. And because of the amount of people who are on online all day, every day, it's just, you know, the sound does cut out. And we look forward to when we can actually just get together again and record it in the flesh because it's just a lot easier and a lot less hassle. So uh, but that but doesn't mean you don't but that doesn't mean you don't have an excuse for not hitting the subscribe button. That's right. So, Matt, where can they find us again? As always, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter. We have... I need to rehearse this better. But yes, we have Instagram, (laughs) Facebook. Uh, You can also uh, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, as well as on Vimeo. Tap the bell button to get notified as we release our content. We will be releasing a pure audio stream soon as well. We uh, just need to uh, get a... uh, uh, service that we need to pay for to do that process and we're just bringing ourselves to part with money for it that's right but we'll we'll get it done and, and we'll do it we're very sort of committed to keeping the blo- uh, keeping the the podcast going and making it better exactly. and better we every, love you guys yeah definitely so thank you so much for listening and thanks for being here matt and in the meantime uh i'm rachel i'm matthew and we're watching good movies and we'll see you on the next one thanks guys au revoir